How beautiful he is. Son of God and man. Son of Man. Beautiful. <coughs> beautiful him. Alright, shall we do... What number was that? That's 240. Is that on a Wow. Five to six. Oh, that was it. Oh, I know. I know him. 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 to this your feast, a memorial of when your son came to you and offered to give himself for the human race, 
and you entered into that place of risk, that if the human race should fall, that you might never see your son again. And you did this for love of us. And it is within this spirit that we have been tasting. And although we've had some challenges this week, we have been greatly blessed and we have been drawn close to you. And I just pray in these closing remarks that you would guide us and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I had the opportunity to, as when I was an Adventist minister, to do an Adventist history and heritage tour to the United States, and I was able to visit several places of the Adventist pioneers. And maybe because I was a little bit jet lagged, we got to Battle Creek. I remember coming into, this is 2006, so we're after 2001. We get into Chicago, and I'm just a little bit spaced because I've been awake most of the night. And I'm coming out, and we have to get a connecting flight to somewhere else. Or, or no, we didn't. We had to go out. And I was going, I was looking up the door, and this guy with a machine gun was standing there. And I'm looking, I'm standing there, and I'm looking where to go. And he said, uh, where do you need to go, sir? I said, I'm just trying, where do you need to go? I said, buddy, just, you know, they were all really intense, fired up. And Welcome to America. So, uh, oh, I need to go this way. So, that was an interesting introduction to me to the United States in 2006. And I remember... I remember standing in the room in Battle Creek in the very house where Ellen White had written much of great controversy. And I just remember the tears coming down my face thinking how precious this book is, how much we've been blessed by the book Great Controversy and what it means to us as a people. Just to be able to stand there in that room. I, I didn't collect any relics, it's all right. <laughs> Just thankful, just being reminded of history and what had taken place and the thankfulness that I felt to know the contents of the book Great Controversy and what the Lord had revealed to Ellen White in that, uh, uh, in the series of uh, obviously visions, but also what she was able to lay out in that book. And it was just very interesting to me because six months earlier than this um, was when uh, Eddie and I had gone to, we'd gone to Penrith from uh, Eden's Landing, and that's when we did Identity Wars, and it was then that, uh, it was the morning after we did, I particularly did the presentation, The Glory of Children is Their Father, uh, and the next morning I woke up, and I didn't know it was a new moon, just happened to be a new moon, by accident, not, and I received a strong impression, this message you must take to the world. This message you must take to the world. So it's interesting that six months later, I'm in the United States and we go to William Miller's farm. And again, I wasn't feeling very well, maybe because I really didn't like flying at that time and uh, that was part of it. But I had other health challenges and issues. I wasn't feeling very well. And it just happens we're, we're on William Miller's farm and we go out and we... We had a service in the little chapel that's on William Miller's property and we washed one another's feet. Uh, Laurel's parents came with me on that trip uh, along with, a, we were with Dr. Alan Lindsay and there was a whole lot of other people that were on that trip on this history and heritage tour. And we're in the grove where William Miller wrestled. And it just so happened that I was also having a wrestle in that grove on that day as to, I was thinking about tell it to the world. I must take this message to the world and how my health, and I found this a real struggle and it was really, really difficult. And I was, while we were in that grove, we were praying and washing one another's feet. I looked up into the heavens and I saw two eagles and I thought of Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so I made that decision to, we're going to tell this to the world, this story, that we, at least as we understood it back then. 
And I often wondered, it's easy to overstate the significance of things, but I wondered why the Lord had told me, you must take this message to the world, and then took me to the very property where William Miller had started his message to give the message at his particular time, why he'd taken me there, and why this thought had come back to me at that time about taking this message to the world and then making that decision in the very grove where William Miller had made a decision to take the message that he had received to the world. Was there any significance to this? What was interesting, interesting to me, of course, is when I looked back carefully at the time frame that I had done this, it was the 17th day of the seventh month that I was there in that grove. What is the 17th day of the seventh month? The third day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Is that a coincidence? Sorry? Yes? <laughs> it could be. That's right. And then it, it's interesting for me, after all the challenges wrestling through Adventism as an Adventist minister and I say to people, I only thought about writing a letter of resignation as a minister about once a month. Because <laughs> of all the challenges and all the issues and fighting uphill with so many issues uh, and believing very differently, to believe what I did, uh, being someone who had followed the writings of, of Robert Wheeland and, and others, to believe in the post-fall nature of Christ placed me in a very narrow a group of people to believe in victory over sin, to believe what I did about 1844, placed me in such a narrow band of ministers within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it was just uphill fight all the way. <coughs> that year of 2006, I had, uh, I had rallied with a couple of other ministers because of the fact that in the teen tent at Big Camp in Brisbane, they were, they were running... Uh, smoke machines and lights and really heavy pff, 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 that sort of uh, music and I was my the fact that my nephew was in that tent I said I have to do something about this I can't uh, you know, not only because of my nephew but because of my my parishioners who were attending they were also in that tent and so um, I went to the I went to the pre conference president and I said look you know this is a problem and uh, he encouraged me to talk to some of the other ministers and arrange a meeting. Well, about seven or eight other ministers became interested. The youth department got wind of what we were doing. They became highly upset and ran a counter campaign against us. Uh, the, uh, the secretary at the time had vowed to have my head on a chopping block along with this other gentleman that was working with me. And uh, when we came to the meeting, uh, because of factional issues and difficulties, of course, the president was caught between two sides and basically when I stood up, I had no support and the leadership stepped back from me and there I was, you know, like saying, why are we doing this? And now you're persecuting the youth leader and he had his head down and he's crying and I'm the ogre and he's, he's the good guy and I'm the bad guy and all that kind of stuff. So... Uh, Little did I know that my head would be in a chopping block very shortly after that, but for a very different reason. But it's very, very interesting that after all these troubled waters, as I'd worked in ministry uh, as an Adventist uh, minister, and as you are, you are involved in division committees and conference committees, and you start to see stuff that you really wish you didn't see. You see the politics, you see the branch stacking, you see the preferences, you see the misallocation of funds, you see all these things going on, you see ministers taking very expensive trips and uh, all these types of things and you're, Lord, what do I do with all this information? You come across young women that have been interfered with by pastors or elders or pathfinder leaders and that was what disturbed me the most. That's really, it's like... Um, and so I was asking lots of questions. So for me, there was a very turbulent, and you might say it was a flood. And so that's why I come to Genesis 8-4, because the 17th day, the 17th, seventh month is very significant for me, because that's when I was in William Miller's farm. And that's when 
What does it say in Genesis 8, 4? And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day. That's when my ark rested, came to rest. And after all the turbulence and the flood and all the challenges and confusion, that the ark rested on the 17th day of the seventh month. And it was during the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's when I felt the conviction, you must take this message to the world. I had no idea how that would happen. I just trusted my father would do this. And so I... I I do find these things for myself significant. Other people may think that I have delusions of grandeur. That's fine. <laughs> it's my experience. It's my reality. That's what happened to me. I was there. I know what happened. And uh, I know that several of you believe that the same thing. And so I wondered why. Why would he take me there? Because I really didn't want to go to the United States uh, for a whole lot of reasons. And uh, what is the significance of this? And so as it, as it turns out, as I observe that the Lord has given through the, the things that he's allowed me to write, a system, a methodology for approaching the character of God in terms of the divine pattern. And it's just interesting that Ellen White makes this comment that the temple, the final temple that God will build, will be built according to the divine pattern. Which again is kind of fun. It's kind of a play on words. Uh, I know she's meaning in terms of Christ, the person of Christ, and that's what it means. But the fact that he gave to us this divine pattern, which is based on Father and Son, and through this divine pattern, God has allowed us to unlock so many things. We've been given a system, a methodology, a framework that puts together so many things. And this is, I believe, a parallel that what happened to the Adventist pioneers that William Miller had a framework, a system, a method of Bible study. And of course, we're using his method of Bible study and we can attribute to William Miller the fact that he, he, his method was the original framework, but we have built upon that framework and come to the divine pattern and that this has presented to us a message. What's interesting is that the Advent movement leading up to, the, to 1843 was not a denominational message. That's, that's important to remember. Miller and his associates worked in many churches. They were not denominational in their approach. They had a message to deliver. And what is it that gave that message momentum? It was highly well researched, it was consistent, it, was, uh, it had method to it, and it was intensely interesting and exciting. And I believe that our Father has given this to us in this message, of the character of our Father. As I was explain, explaining it this morning, the message that God has given to us is the seal of God. What is the seal of God? The character of our Father. How do we receive this seal? Through the gift of the Holy Spirit. When do we receive this? At His appointments. It's very clear, isn't it? So it's the sealing message that has been given to us. His character by the Spirit during His appointments. That's the essence of the message and all the pieces that go together with that. And I watch with wonder how our Father has developed this. And at this particular time, we are having groups of people who are studying this message in several countries. Uh, we are now... Uh, God has given to us the ability to go into at least 36 languages in many, many different countries. And I'm just... Wow, this is just amazing. But it is God and His Son and their angels that are driving this movement and leading people to it. The message is such that it has the capacity to draw people and for people to act upon this message, not being told by another man what to do, but to act upon their own God-given abilities and to be led by the Spirit of God, not by any other man, and to go forth with that message and do what God has called them to do. This is the context of the Millerite message. William Miller, 
developed a system of prophecy and approach to scripture with the payload being the second coming of Jesus Christ. And many men quickly adapted to this, took the core principle of this, expanded in their own way, in their own thinking, and the message exploded and went to every mission station around the world within a very short period of time. And based on the principle, again, of the divine pattern, we should look to the history between 1831 and 1844 as a pattern, as a source to what is going to happen for us in the days leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Is that a fair assessment? Mm -hmm. Our hearts are turned to our fathers. We need to look to what happened to our forefathers, what took place, how the things came about, and look at the pattern. Ellen White does actually say something along the lines of, there were a number of events between 1840 and 1844 that, and I'm, I'm trying to remember, and some of you can, maybe Colin, you can remember this, that, that this was actually a reference to the seven thunders in the book of Revelation. The events that took place between 1840 and 1844, there were seven significant events that took place that correspond to the seven thunders in the book of Revelation. And what I'm suggesting to you is that this, because everything works on divine pattern, this is a source, so we look to this as our forefathers, as a basis for what is coming. And what I find interesting about, and I want to restate this, because of what happened in my history, because of what has developed, because of the way that William Miller operated, it was not a denominational process. It was interdenominational. It went to every church. It went to every place. And I believe that this is the way that we need to operate. We don't want to operate with creeds or church structures. We need to operate purely in the context of a message that requires a vehicle to be able to be transported to every mission station around the world. And it's for this reason, oh, and I suppose, just want to step back a little bit, because many people challenge, challenge us and say, oh, well, let, let me frame it to you this way. I was having a discussion with Ty Gibson seven years ago, and uh, I was explaining to him my understanding of the Son of God, the begotten Son of God. And I gave to him the books that I had at the time. Divine Pattern, Return of Elijah, Identity Wars. He has them all. There's all of those books. Uh, if you read his book, The Sonship of Christ, you'll realise, well, he didn't accept <laughs> what I wrote in my book. Which is understandable. But there was a, there was a moment in, in which... He, he had understood that I had come to find a way to be reconciled to the church, which I, I always am I'm always looking for a way to be reconciled with my brethren. And as he listened to my story and the beauty of the, the Son of God, the begotten Son of God, he said to me, I can preach everything you're preaching, Adrian, and still believe in the Trinity. And, uh, and I, I didn't say anything. I just, oh, okay, <laughs> I don't know how. Uh, and then he said to me, uh, and the tone just changed very quickly. You should not have gone outside the council of your brethren. And I said, well, if, if, I follow that, if, if we follow that principle to its logical conclusion, the Protestant Reformation never would have started. Just like, just like that mirror. There's a mirror there, isn't there? He could, but he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't preach anything that he preaches. No, no. It's not even synthetically close. Uh, and, and it's a tragedy. It's a great tragedy. Ty Gibson's a lovely person. He's a really nice person. Um, and as I said, um, uh, the Protestant Reformation never would have taken place. Well, that was the wrong thing to say. Because then he got upset. 
And he said, the Adventist church is not Rome and you are not Martin Luther. So I, I said, absolutely correct, but it doesn't change the principle. <laughs> it doesn't change the principle that every man must act according to his conscience. I do not go to another man to ask what to believe. I go to the word of God to study what to believe and I share it with my brethren and I compare with them and I study with them in an open heart and a free spirit not to be told what to believe. Not that I want to be rebellious but I only trust the word of God. I don't trust myself. And so to go outside you know, the counsel of my brethren in terms of what I can believe I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong place. As was expressed to me in a response to my document, and, and if you're not familiar, the book Return of Elijah, in the back appendices of that book, I have most of the correspondence between myself and the church, the letters that they wrote and the letters that I wrote uh, out there. And one of the things they said to me in terms of what I was doing and what I was presenting from the Word of God, uh, they said, we do not encourage you in your line of thinking. So, well, what I think has nothing to do with you. <laughs> I present to you what I find from the Word of God. We discuss it together. I listen carefully to the arguments that you present. And I pray about them and I ask my Father, are these things so? If they are so, I accept them. And I say, thank you for showing me this. That's fantastic, wonderful. If they are not so, I say, well, brethren, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Could you explain this to me? And, of course, they have the creed. They have the 28. And everything is like, well, we have our 28, and that's, it just stops all creative thinking. And I saw this for many reasons uh, some years ago, why the church structure that I was a part of, why it could not survive. It could not survive for a number of reasons. And again, as I've pointed out in the Divine Pattern in the book Life Matters, the, the decision of the church to develop a co-equal leadership structure in terms of men and women, both being pastors and leaders within the church, I knew that this would fracture the church and lead to its dismantling as a worldwide organization. I knew that Africa and other parts of the world would never accept that kind of approach. And as many Western countries have decided, well, we'll just all do our own thing. Well, as soon as you're doing your own thing, you are fragmenting and you are splitting and you are falling apart. I knew that was one issue. I knew the other issue was that when you stifle a church with excited people with open Bibles and their faces all aglow, bringing something to the church that they're excited about and they get shut down in the basis of we have 28, that church is going to die. It's going to die. It will not survive. If you shut down that sort of Bible study and you do not answer it with Scripture, you will die. And these are lessons for us. You cannot shut down another person's argument by simply saying, we do not hold to this position. That is the stupidest thing you can say. You only respond with, well, this is what I understand. And this is what I have found in Scripture. And I can show you what I have. And we all pray together and consult together. And that's the only way you can answer, is what you understand the truth to be. Never appeal to a document or a list of, of, of doctrines and beliefs and say, this is what we hold to uh, and, and any deviation from this we will not tolerate. J.N. Loughborough told us the five-point sequence of what you do when you set up a creed. You, most of you have read this. You're familiar with this. Once you set up a creed, then you start to discipline people who don't follow that creed, then follows persecution these are all the things that are just ahead of us. And already some of us are experiencing this disfellowship process and disconnection from the church because the church has determined to shut down the freedom of the individual. And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, the Lord has placed in my heart and in my mind 
the absolute sovereignty of the individual, not to be coerced by any external force other than be, to be compelled by love alone. The freedom of the individual to think freely, to act freely, without coercion. This is one of the highest principles to me personally. And so, all these things coming upon us at the present time about mandates, to operate as a collective against the free will of the individual, this is anathema to me. And I will never... Never surrender to those ideals. Never. To surrender to those ideals is to lose my soul and my sanity. It violates God's character. And it violates God's character. If you love these people, you will do this. I'm sorry. (laughs) You must convince me with reason and logic and argument. Do not convince me with threats and penalties. And all these types of things. I will not surrender to those things. My mind must be convinced. As someone said to me when I presented my views on the Son of God back in 2011, 2010 and 11. One man said to me, look around Adrian, how many other ministers believe what you believe? Are you the only one that thinks you have the truth? I said, I must follow my conscience. He said, you and your wretched conscience. Oh. Oh. Beautiful. Excuse the sarcasm. Okay, I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong place. Ellen White went against the grain, all the foot went against the grain. You know, that they met. Yes. Opposed to normal structured thinking. And, and Bill, the thing is this. We do not go against the grain for the sake of going against the grain. We go against the grain because the truth leads us against the grain. That's why we go against the grain. I don't want to go against the grain. I want to live a happy, peaceful life. But I will not purchase peace with the sacrifice of truth. I must follow the truth where it leads me. And I remember my head elder in one of the churches where I was pastoring said to me after preaching a sermon, uh, something along those lines of conviction. I was preaching about the daughters of Babylon and I said some very straight things from the spirit of prophecy, from the book Early Writings and challenged some existing thinking. And And the head elder said to me, Adrian, you're going to have a very difficult life. He says, I'm not arguing with what you're saying. It's just, you just have a way of expressing yourself in the most inappropriate ways. It's just my conviction about the truth. I try not to be argumentative. I try not to be rude and repulsive to people. I'm excited about the things that I'm learning. Excitement can be perceived as arrogance. It can be. Danielle says amen. (laughs) Some of us that descend from European nationality, we do struggle a little bit in that department. (laughs) Haven't quite mastered the British approach to things. But anyway. They were part of Europe. (laughs) They had a very different approach. (laughs) Well, I mean, I'm partly from that part of the world as well. So my mother's forebears came from Lancashire in England. So the other side was from the Celts. So, uh, we have a bit of that. So, here we find ourselves in a, in a very unique situation. The events that have transpired over the last number of years, the efforts of the church that many of us have come from to persuade people, not only with argument, but also with loss of job, if they do not submit to the mandates, tells me of a church that is in its death throes. Is it too striking to say these things? 
For some it might be. I'm just telling you what I'm seeing. I'm just telling you what I'm understanding. To trample upon the rights of conscience on something as to what you place in your body and to fire people from their positions is crossing a line. It is a violation. It is an evidence of a church that is having its eyes gouged out and is treading corn for the Philistines. You're going to have a very difficult life. (laughs) (laughs) We will certainly say it will be eventful. As someone said to me, and I wrote this in the Book of Atonement, exactly those words. The church is having its eyes gouged out and it is treading corn for the Philistines. And this person said, that's rather harsh. And I said, I thought that was a compliment. (laughs) Because Samson wins in the end, doesn't he? He loses his life. But he murders a whole bunch of Philistines. (laughs) But he does a great defeat to the Philistines, taking the symbolism of that event. Samson is in the list of the faithful in in, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And I said, that's the best compliment I could muster under the circumstances. That there will be those, I believe, from within those ranks who will play a part in that movement that we talked about yesterday, that will uh, do the work of Elijah to confront its own church with its idolatry. Uh, And I pray, I wish that movement well, that will set up the process for this movement to take place. I want to address uh, something to follow on from what Shimon was saying before. And this is, this is something that is difficult for us because if we are focused on a message, because many of us have come from a de- denominational mindset, it's hard to think outside of denominational thinking and it's easy for us to re-establish ourselves in a denominational process and to establish a ministry and to establish mechanisms and, and that's why I've been holding this off as long as possible while we have been getting the message clear in our minds because once machinery comes into place, organisation follows. If organisation follows of a denominational nature we are in danger of making steps towards a creed. And that is something that I never want to be a part of. It was ultimately necessary for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to organise in the way that they did because of the fact that the church could not break itself free from dispensational forms of thinking. And it is true that Christ may have come. Ella White says in 1883 that Christ could have come before 1883. Now, if that had been the case, there would have not been very much need for very formal organisation. But because the church backed away, they went, they went into the later scene condition, I see that is why there was a need for organisation of a denominational nature. But we are in such a state at the present time as leading up to the final events of human history that I, I believe we are returning back to the events that happened with William Miller that were not denominational, they were message-based. And every man followed his own conscience. They studied the materials themselves. The Lord himself showed them what they were to do and they did it and they were moved by the unction of the Holy Spirit not by the authority of men. And I, this is the platform that I believe that we need to stand upon. Amen. Many people ask me, or they, I can tell they're waiting for someone like myself or one of the elders to tell them what to do. While we can make suggestions, you need to ask God what to do. <laughs> ask your father what to do. He knows your talents and your gifts and your mind. Uh, We don't. 
We may have snippets of it and understanding and see gifts and talents and abilities. We can make suggestions and make opportunities available in some cases. But if this is message is going to move rapidly, each man will take to himself, each woman will take to herself the conviction, I'm a, I'm a debtor to the Jew and to the Greek. I'm a debtor. I must take this message. I must take this and show me. Necessity is the mother of invention. We have a necessity to preach this message and to take it to the world. As a message, and maybe this identity issue is not, uh, that we have an identity issue. While we have come out of Christian denominations, it cannot be said that we identify with Christianity. We're going to have a very hard life, Eddie. Why don't we identify with Christianity? We do not agree with the God they worship, the days that they worship upon, their dispensational framework, their immortality of the soul, their atonement, their appeasement, their justice system, everything. We don't agree with any of it. And therefore, we are not Christian. According to the world. According to the world, thank you. According to their creeds. According to their creeds. We are separate to the world. This is a challenge, isn't it? Yet, we identify with the Christian faith. On many levels, we have received the message that we have through the Christian faith. And we have been greatly blessed by these things. This is a great challenge. People ask me, what denomination are you? (laughs) I don't want to be smart aleck or say anything foolish or anything like that. Should I say Seventh-day Adventist? I don't believe in the Trinity. I don't believe in a God that kills and destroys people. I don't believe that he's going to burn all the wicked up at the end of the thousand years. I believe in the feasts. I believe in the statutes. I believe in the Torah. All of it. What agreement is there? This is a challenge. And because, as we have discussed from the 2520, from the scattering of Israel at the time of Daniel and being sent into Babylon in 677, well, he was sent a bit later, around 605, 606 BC, but the captivity in 677 BC, 2520 through to 1843, 1844, gives us a direct connection to Israel. This means that our roots are in Israel. This is what we believe. If you haven't studied it, <laughs> this is what we've been studying. Our roots are in Israel and the Torah. Are we Jewish? No. But our faith has come from this place. There are many similarities that we have in our Torah observance, but we have differences in our understanding. Again, A God that doesn't kill and destroy. (laughs) Of course, we believe that Jesus Christ is the begotten Son of God, which is the fundamental difference that we have. We also believe that Christ, as it says in the book Desire of Ages, He stood at the great epoch between two great eras and their festivals. And he instituted in the place of the Jewish Passover, the communion. This is what I understand. We, we do not celebrate the national festival of the Jews. We celebrate the international festival that Christ established. But it's very much based on the Jewish Passover. And we call it Passover. We call it unleavened bread. It's very, very similar But we are not celebrating our literal removal as a national identity coming out of Egypt in 1450 BC or thereabouts. But there's many things that we identify with. We love the law of Moses. We love the festivals. We love the statutes. We've come to understand these things. The churches that we've come from do not love these things, believe that these things are nailed to the cross. 
And therefore we have much more identification with Judaism than we do with Christianity. And this creates somewhat of an identity. Who do we identify with? And there's many answers that we could give to this. But I remember when I was studying the subject of the feasts, and I was looking at the way other people were keeping the feasts, and I was freaking out, <clears throat> looking at how they were doing things. And I remember praying about this, and my Savior saying to me, Adrian, do not look at the way that other people do things. Just study the Scriptures and follow me. That's all you have to do. One of the subjects that illustrates the conflict of identity. And I want to be open and lay this out before you. Is in, On the Day of Atonement in, in uh, 2020, after having finished the manuscript for Escaping the Pentagon of Lies, and I spent a lot of time talking about Kronos, and how much Kronos, the concept of time, deadlines and time and these things, eat into <coughs> our understanding of the character of God that these things are very much a Greek concept and idea. And how Paul wisely wrote about these things. Revelation chapter 10 verse 4, he talked about an angel standing with his hand raised to heaven with one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, saying that there should be Kronos no longer. What a wise thing to say. We understand the Adventist context for this. But it has a much deeper meaning. There should be Kronos no longer. And we have within Adventism the continual repeating of Kronos worship in setting dates and times and prophecies and reapplying the 1335, 1290, 1260, 2300 as offerings to Kronos. This is not the path that God has shown us. There's going to be no deadlines. It's going to be based purely upon love for God and His only begotten Son. And so, as a memorial to this, I began to think about the fact that our Savior in Scripture, His name is Yeshua or Yeshua. And the thought to me was, I would, like to, I would like to use this name as a memorial of my freedom from Kronos, the God that I had served. But as we discussed this, it's okay for members and some of you within our assembly, use the name Yeshua with affection, which I'm deeply thankful for. But the difficulty is if I use this name in the position that I occupy, that creates a problem. Why does that create a problem? Because changing for me in the position that I am, it is a statement of identity and identification. In using that name to the untrained ear that is saying that I am a messianic or that I am a Jew, or a Jew that believes in Christ, messianic. And this creates uncomfortability for Christians. If they hear this name, do I have to use this name? Do I have to speak in this name? It raises a whole lot of challenges. And people that are listening coming from the Christian side become un unnerved by the use of this terminology. But in not using those names, we are alienating another community. And, of course... It, uh, it grieves me that there are people within the Messianic community that say that the name Jesus is satanic and it's representative of Zeus. And uh, I, find, I have found it hard in the past not to condemn and judge people who take that position. But it's a conflict, isn't it? And there is responsibility that is required. And that's why I have refrained from publicly using this name, because I don't want to cause stress for people. <clears throat> Although, I know from what the Bible tells me that that's his name. Amen. And just as in the books that I have written in Arabic and Russian and Serbian, my name is pronounced and said a whole bunch of different ways. 
and they all refer to me, and that's fine. I have no problem with this at all. And Jesus is a transliteration of the name Yeshua. It's a Greek transliteration, and that's fine. I believe it's a divine pattern. Hebrew source, Greek channel. I believe that the Greek language has offered us a precision of understanding for the Western mind to be able to grasp aspects of the gospel, and it has its place. I do not see Greek and Hebrew in antagonism to one another, as many in the Messianic community loathe Greek culture and understanding, and many in Christian culture despise Hebrew thinking and understanding. Being opposite on these issues is just evidence of the oppositional mind. But it doesn't have to be opposite. It can be together. Some of you may be having a heart pounding. What's I going to say next? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? No, I'm cool. I don't underestimate the role that I play within this message and this movement. I'm just... And I'm going to continue as I have done in the past. I'm just telling you, this is an issue of identification. And do we have fear? A new, a new identity war. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make people unnecessarily uncomfortable. If it's necessary, I'm willing to make anyone uncomfortable. That's not a problem for me. <laughs> but if it's not necessary, I don't want to make people uncomfortable. And so, this is, this, this is I'm, I'm opening a dialogue, I'm opening a discussion, and I'm looking forward to Shimon sharing more of his thoughts from his, his walk through the Torah and what he's learnt and some of the things. I'd like to be able to have this discussion and to be able to operate in this way so that we lose our fear that if we become, we use more of the Hebrew language. Now, one of the difficulties, of course, is well, if you start saying Yeshua, well, then there's Jehovah. And then you start saying Ruach. And then you start saying Hamashiach. And all these la And how many of these words do you need to use to be considered part of the card-carrying believers? This is a difficulty, isn't it? Because people start asking these questions and they start practicing using these words, not because they're deeply convicted about it, because they just want to be part of the family. And then it becomes an informal creed. And this is a difficulty that we have to deal with. And, uh, you know, we don't want shibboleth tests. You know what a shibboleth is? The story in the Old Testament of how that a particular uh, sect of the Israel community, how they would pronounce the word shibboleth. And because they had come from a certain place, they couldn't pronounce it the way, and they, uh, it revealed their identity. Because they couldn't say it in a certain way. <laughs> Your speech betrays you. <laughs> Your speech betrays you. But... Picking up on what Shimon was saying earlier today, there is a gold mine waiting for us in the Torah. And I, I would like to, in my own understanding, I would like to move more into that platform and find that gold that we're looking for. I believe that there will be some people within the, within the, the Jewish mind that will connect with this message and they will be able to bring to this message a depth of richness of understanding that we have not seen. And that's what I'm hoping for and looking for. It means that we will run the risk of being called Jews of the flesh. And this will create uncomfortable discussions and all of those types of things. But... We can't move from fear. We have to move from truth and these types of things. And I know that my excitement in being delivered from Kronos in the Day of Atonement of, of 2020 led me to act a little prematurely, uh, for which I apologise to my fellow elders. We have to walk in concert on some of these things because I don't want shibboleth tests when Adrian starts using certain language. Oh, now I've got to start to use Hebrew and... All of those things. I know my wife will be having discussions with me if uh, nicely. She, you know my wife. She's very nice. I can declare a verse uh, somewhere that says to be 
It it says he that is a Jew is a Jew in the heart. And uh, well, we can look at that Romans two twenty nine. Romans two twenty nine. <coughs> But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So, that's the one you're talking about? No, I think there was another one, but I can't remember. All right. So, this is just one of the issues that I'm just wanting to speak about and these issues are, are difficult to manage because people who don't have a deep understanding of our message and its freedoms will find it difficult and are just looking for what I have to do, what I have to say and this will create conflict and I don't want any conflict on this issue and I'm only saying it's a symbolism of this identity struggle as to who we identify with. At this stage most of us would identify with Christianity but we're realizing that this message is transcending much of Christianity and that, in fact, the Christian doctrine is definitely at war with the God that we serve. It's also true that Judaism is at war with the God that we serve because they reject his only begotten son. And it's the same with Islam and other things like that. But the Jewish faith is in the best position to receive this message because of the, the platform that, that we are upon. I've had plenty of people, particularly in the United States, the, 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 uh, the American mind is <laughs> freedom-loving in some respects. And uh, I've had plenty of people say to me, Adrian, you need to be reaching out to our Messianic brethren and sharing some of your message. You know, By saying the things that you're saying, um, it's turning people off because of the language you're using. And of course, my immediate response, well, it's not my problem. But, and it's not. <laughs> if they want the truth, they, they should be able to step over those things. And if, if that is a problem to them, then they're not ready for this message. And, that, and that's fair enough. But, uh, I, I, I would like to open a dialogue about this and how we move forward. Because we have to think about these types of things. Because it, it's still something that I believe my Saviour spoke to me on, on the Day of Atonement in regard of a memorial of the release from Kronos. And that was a ded dedicating my life to Yeshua and to serve him and to follow him. I, I've had all my prayers answered in the name of Jesus and I will continue to do so. I have absolutely no, no fears about that whatsoever. But I'm challenging our identity. That's what I'm doing by asking this question. Challenging our identity and how we identify ourselves. And this is somewhat of a sabbatical. So I'm trying to run a moratorium for myself both in my level of writing and how much that we stretch ourselves or challenges that I put to you about things that I'm, I'm thinking about. So nothing's going to change for the, for the near future on, on that regard. So all those that are worried, you can stop worrying. But I'd like to have a dialogue about, about these things and how we approach them. And I know that a number of you in, in the community uh, would like that discussion to take place, but this is where we come to the other point. The central features of this message relate to God and His only begotten Son, their character and their appointments. Outside of this, people can hold a varying range of views and understandings. And I think that's healthy. Uh, for the most part, as long as what is held does not contradict uh, those elements of what I would call the first angel's message. Fear God, Father and Son. Give glory to Him, character of God. The hour of His judgment has come uh, in terms of, again, the character of God, who is judging whom. Worship Him that made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. That's a reference to the Sabbath and, I believe, the festivals. That's all in the first angel's message. Outside of this... We may have a, a range of different views. I pray that in the character of God that we have come to understand that, we, that others can hold a different view from us on a particular point. Because this was important in Millerism, in the Millerite 
they had a whole range of different ideas on other areas and it didn't stop them because their <laughs> love and their enthusiasm for the character of God message overrode all of those things. And it provided freedom for God's people to just follow their own conscience. And therefore, outside of these things, other subjects, and, and this is only by manner of appeal, because there's no coercion of conscience and there is no punishment <laughs> connected to these things. But... I'm just appealing on these things. Other things should be secondary, in my mind, to our study of the character of God. Obviously, things of a political nature, we don't, discuss, we don't worry about talking about those things. They're irrelevant in terms of the message that God has given us. Or siding with different political sides is completely pointless. Our views on vaccination, personally on vaccination, I stand for the liberty of conscience. If a person is convicted to be vaccinated, I support that conviction. And I'm not, once they, and this is a point, this is a point, this is a pastoral point that I would ask you to consider. Once someone has taken a decision to be vaccinated, stop talking to them about <laughs> the problems of vaccination. It's utterly pointless. You're only trying to stick it up their nose. And it doesn't work. Leave. Just, okay, you've made your decision. Okay, that's fine. I've presented the evidence. Mm. I've talked to friends of mine within the movement that are holding high positions in the movement. They've made that decision. I love them. I respect them. They've looked at the information I've provided. End of story. Yeah. I support their freedom of conscience. <coughs> so I, I appeal for no partisanship mm. on the issue of vaccination. And I would, I would say the same thing. And I... I thought Craig was going to have a hard life when he mentioned about the cosmology of the earth. <laughs> about the flat no earth. judgment or condemnation here. Yeah. Believe what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> There's very passionate positions on both sides of this question. Mm. And I, I, believe, I believe that I like to have subjects in which people can have different understandings without any fear of condemnation. And I believe this to be one of those subjects where we can hold different understandings. And if someone has a different understanding to us, praise God. It's completely fine. It doesn't matter. We don't have to convince one another on this particular subject. And I, I pray that... Um, I've thought long and hard about this in terms of bringing this subject into the public arena. Compared, compared to these subjects, it's like wading through manure. This is gold. This is, this is what's most important. I know these other subjects hold a lot of interest and fascination for us, but I believe, and again, I'm only presenting my view. This is not law. I'm just presenting my view. And... I believe that this would involve us in controversy that would derail us from our central message in regard to the character of God. So I encourage every person to hold their convictions. Study it. Believe it. If God should show us that this becomes important and it needs to become part of our platform, He will show us on these subjects. Until then, I'm just appealing. Let's, let's not make this a, a point of urgency to convince and uh, other people on this point. It's only a request, of course. Every person has to be free to follow their own conviction and to share as freely as they want with everybody. Because I, I want to encourage the free flow of information. I'm just saying, in my mind, uh, this subject is very much secondary at the present time. And the Spirit of Prophecy tells us, and I would like to, say, I would like to mention it this way, because some people forget this, whether the earth is round or flat let it be what it is Amen. can you change it <laughs> and notice she started with the Copernican theory whether it's round or flat either one don't, don't make that a central issue study it, follow it believe what you're going to believe about this but she said the third angel's message. And some people would say, oh, Daniel's got his hand up. Oh. <laughs> he thought he was going to tell me something. 
No, I'm just speaking from a pastoral perspective as I, as I watch what's going on in, in different communities. Believe what you want to believe and be completely free. I want people to believe according to conscience without feeling they have to believe a certain thing to be part of this community. And, and at this present time, this issue is a good test of our maturity. To be able to walk, work together, walk together, even if we have a different understanding... I cherish that ability because most communions are not able to do this. They have to be conformed to one position in order to be part of that communion. And I don't support this idea at all. So, and I'm sure some of you are saying, yeah, well, when everyone gets the memo that I have the truth on this subject and then it becomes part of the platform, then you'll know that I was right. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) <laughs> fair enough but my, my, my primary focus and I'm just laying out for you uh, briefly uh, we've, we've taken a decision as we've talked about this and we're appealed to on this point that we want to now shift into in our, at least in our feast times that we provide much more facilities for the instruction of children which, are, which is probably a little bit overdue, but uh, we're at the right place now where we can do that. In order to make that transition, we need machinery, we need organisation, which means we're going to have to start to do some of those things. Uh, and other people are going to need to step into those situations, in those positions to help make those things happen. I would like to see in our free time in the afternoon, I was talking to Marco about this, we might have some afternoon activities of going fossicking and doing things like that. We can do activities, going canoeing, going, doing whatever, and doing things, with, making things and doing all kinds of things. This is a transition if we take this step. We, 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 now we are taking this step. And that, that does involve responsibility to the government and to protect ourselves from potential challenges that could come from those things. We're only taking these steps because of necessity. I mean, normally we just go ahead and do them, but we've got to, we live in the world and we have to operate according... As, as We have to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. And we need to do that. So, for myself, the next, the next seven-year cycle involves a simplification process of what we have been studying. A lot more channel material, a lot more Bible study material, leaflets... Shorter booklets. I can hear Gary Holquist yelling out, Amen, from the other side of the Pacific. And others. Thank you all for your patience as we've been trying to lay out the, the core elements and nut them out. I think we've got to that point now where the, the core structure has been established. And for this to be established, I I suppose it's been a 20-year process if we go back to the beginning of Identity Wars, but the acceleration of building that structure has been over the last seven years. years. And I believe that our participating in the festivals has been the reason for that acceleration as to why we have been able to do this and why we're now operating in several countries uh, and people are picking up this message and, and running with this message. So the next seven years... I hope to see, as I was saying, I'm just fleshing out some ideas for you. A lot of you were intrigued about the material that we saw on EMF and lighting, blocking blue light and things like that. We have the opportunity, I'm just thinking, and <coughs> Ruben and I have talked about this, about if you go to a market and you just pl- plonk these books on a table, you're not going to draw as much interest as if you have plants or maybe you can have blue light blocking things or some stuff on EMF mm. products that you and, and information on that level and then have some books on the table as well to make available. Markets I think are going to become an important process. Cold portering, going to the doors and again there's going to be a need for simplification uh, and do you want to, no? mm. <laughs> I thought your hand was going up. <laughs> Part of the simplification process, we're going to have to write a whole lot of children's booklets and materials. Uh, This is already beginning to take place, uh, but uh, we're going to do this at a much more rapid rate 
I believe, over the next seven year period so we get the simplification process taking place. I do hope, and this is my, this is just my thought process, that the last seven years have been the foundation. The next seven years are the simplification and trialling out transmission processes in terms of getting things out. And that will happen over the next seven years. And then it's the seven years after that that I anticipate an explosion will take place and the earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. That's, I'm just guessing. You know, this is my thought process on, on the basis of sevens. Because the Spirit of Prophecy says that God teaches His people to number by sevens. It's a seven process that we're talking about. And clearly that over the last seven year period, a foundation has been established. Now we can begin the simplification process. As, I, as I've said many times in the past, we have been working on the motor. Now we can put the bucket seats in, we can put the, the leather on, we can put the air conditioning in and all those lovely things in the stereo system and make everybody happy. Uh, but everyone will have to play their part to do these things. Uh, and I trust that God will, uh, will lead each of us. I'm trusting this will be the case that uh, each person will not be asking another person what they need to do, but they will do what God tells them to do. And typically the way things have operated here is when someone makes a move and then starts to act, the movement will act to support and fund and help them in what they are doing. Uh, if, you come, if you come to the leadership and say, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? You're going to get not much response. It just, it's not, there's not going to be much response to that. Like, well, yeah, it's a great idea. Do it. Make it happen. You, use your God-given gifts and your ingenuity that God has given you and we'll back you. Make it happen. And, and this, will, this is the way that we're going to have to operate. So, uh, as I concluded at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, in 2013, I'm reminded of that in closing, that <clears throat> of the things that we have experienced, the things that we are learning, the beautiful things that we're seeing in the character of God, we come back to Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? Who is going to believe our report of the things that we have seen and the things that we have heard? And the things that we have handled are the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and declare unto you that eternal life that was with the Father and is manifested unto us. And as it says here of Messiah, in terms of this movement, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Who could have imagined that this movement could come about and take place? Satan surely must have been convinced that he had this sewn up box and dice. He had the whole thing covered. But lo and behold, this message comes forth just as God predicted in Revelation chapter 18 and as the spirit of prophecy pinpointed in life sketches 412 where it says when the great towers in New York come down, then the fourth angel will begin to sound. Exactly. This is what happened and has taken place. He hath no form nor comeliness. We're a ragtag bunch, aren't we? <laughs> and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Nobody desires this message. Of course, I'm giving a spiritual application to the text. But I'm talking about the spirit of Jesus, where it manifests the person of Christ. This is an application of that understanding. People look at this message. There's no beauty in this. How come they can't see it? A God that is ever merciful, never condemning, never judging. Why can't they see the beauty in this? Oh, Lord, open their eyes that they might see the truth. And so as we come to the end of the feast, I want to commend all of you to our Father in heaven. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Shall we sing a song? Amen. Number? Five, seven, five. Oh, wow. Five, seven, five.
I was thinking of something a little more rousing, Ruben. Do the rousing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's a no. And then we should be singing the... Yeah. Yeah. Six, four, two. Something rousing. No, no, I'm thinking of... Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. No. What is it? Number? Thank you. All right. Yes. Liam is standing up. Each man be fully persuaded in his own mind. <laughs> and woman, for that matter. And these are They need to be Passover, that your spirit will enter into each of our hearts and that each man, each woman, each child will know their duty as a debtor both to the Jew, to the Greek and to all men and women of the world. Father, we pray for wisdom, for maturity, for clarity. Help us in this simplification process to develop the materials into all of the languages that it may be spoken in the simplicity of a child, that our Father is truly love, and His only begotten Son, your Son, our Lord, is the full expression of your character. Seal this into our hearts, guide us as we travel home, grant us opportunities to share 
and bless us until we come together again in the near future. In Jesus' name. Amen.